Ah, grüezi miteinander. Let's talk about the heterojunction bipolar transistor. It's a very cool device, and we will harness a lot of the knowledge we've gained in the course so far. Uh, we're now uh, here at the HBT, heterojunction bipolar transistor. We'll, of course, start from the equilibrium, uh, go to DC, and then a lot of the small signal capacitances, etc., that we already discussed for the BJT and for the uh, PN diode are going to be just as relevant here, so we're not going to cover that explicitly, but all of that knowledge will transfer. All right, so here's the outline. Pretty long, it's eight segments. We'll go through it. Uh, let's start with some applications, some concepts, innovations, and a uh, pretty cool prize. All right, we talked about um, the bipolar junction transistor and its applications to high frequencies. Uh, we derived a bunch of equations where we looked at gain and we looked at frequency cutoff. And um, why are we doing this? Well, you need these devices for really optical fiber communication. So in all your cellular networks um, where you have uh, optical fibers, you have um, devices that run uh, at pretty high speeds and they need to amplify. So we need devices that uh, are amplifiers at those frequencies. Uh, we need uh, D to A and A to D, digital, analog, analog, digital converters uh, to convert um, analog signals into digital. There's still a lot of research going on, especially now in military applications for military radar and communications. And that's in general a trend um, that um, a lot of the advancements in this RF technology really make it um, into commercial spaces uh, via the military uh, research efforts that are uh, being pursued. So uh, that's not unusual. And then there is a whole world of monolithic millimeter wave uh, integrated circuits, also called MIMICs. These are really the front ends to receivers and transmitters. So think about all the communication networks that you encounter. Uh, whatever you have on your cell phone, it has an antenna in it, it needs to be amplified. Um, the signal needs to be amplified. So um, then there's the opportunity to push all this into the terahertz re hertz regime, um, where the higher cutoffs are then desired and a different frequency spectrum can be explored. All right. So let's go back a little bit again. Uh, we thought we had really designed the um, bipolar junction transistor as good as we can. We had a graded based transport, we had a polysilicon emitter, and uh, we derived uh, expressions for the uh, cutoff frequency. We had um, understood um, how making uh, doping variations in the base and in the emitter can be good, they can be bad. Um, uh, how too low of a doping in the collector was causing all kinds of problems, and um, how really the gain was cutting off at um, uh, high frequencies. So uh, let's see what else we can do. And the term we're going to look at is something that we haven't looked at at all, because we have considered that the emitter and base are the same material. So this coefficient ni squared b and ni squared e we consider to be one because intrinsically these two materials, emitter and a base, are the same. Now, in a heterojunction bipolar transistor, we make them to be different. So that's the key element, and let's uh, look at it a little bit um, why you might do that um, and where this intuition comes from that you should be doing this. So if you look at this ratio, forget about how we got to this ratio, uh, you can plug in the normal expressions for Ni, uh, uh, the intrinsic carrier concentration for any given semiconductor. And if you write down the ratio for uh, like this, you will find that this ratio turns out to have an exponent where you take the difference between the two band gaps, between the um, numerator and the denominator. Okay? So, in this expression here, what you see is that the emitter band gap should be larger than the base band gap. All right, so why would that be? Let's look at a little bit of where this came from. Where did this expression come from? 
Remember this Gummel plot? We plotted the base current, the collector current, and we had expressions for the forward uh, bias uh, base emitter junction, reverse bias uh, collector junction, and um, had written down uh, the currents for the uh, uh, collector current, the base current, took the ratio and have this beta DC. So that's how this term NI uh, um, B squared and NI E squared, that's where this com uh, came from. All right. Let's look a little bit of what that means. So here's a, a sketch of the transistor again. The uh, collector current is the minor are the minority carriers that are going forward. We inject the minority carriers here, uh, on the decay linearly, right? And we would like to have that as large as possible, right? That's our forward current that we want to drive. Uh, on the uh, base side here, the base current is basically the, the current that is going back into the base, uh, um, into the emitter from the base, and we want that to be as small as possible. Okay, so how do we increase IC? Well, we need to we can increase NI, which is up here, and therefore, and we'll do that by a decrease in EG. And uh, here, the goal is really to decrease the minority holes um, that are flowing back into the uh, emitter. And uh, so we could uh, say we want to decrease NI and therefore increase uh, EG. Okay, so those are the more physical arguments, but the ultimate goal really is here, can you reduce this whole current and can you increase this forward collector current? That's the main goal, and what this says is you want to have the emitter band gap to be larger than the base band gap. Okay, now Shockley realized that an uh, HBT is possible. Herbert Cromer uh, provided the foundation of the field. He worked on the details. He did the experiments to really get this on its way. And uh, he won a Nobel Prize in 2000 for the invention of this HBT and the heterojunction as such. Uh, he shared it with Alfarov, uh, a Russian scientist who also worked on heterostructures. All right, but Herb Cromer really worked on the on the transistor piece. All right, so today some the HPT might look something like this, and it's pretty much anywhere where you have electronics that is communicating um, uh, through free space or through fibers, etc. You need um, uh, these high-powered, high-frequency amplifiers. Okay. So how does this look um, in a sort of um, educational sense, right? In one dimensions, uh, what you have is again an NPN junction. You typically have an a N plus collector side on the contact side. And now you're saying you'd like to increase the band gap in the emitter over the band gap in the base, okay? Now, there's another uh, uh, form of this transistor where you also increase the band gap in the collector, and we'll cover that in the uh, next sections as well. So we'll talk about an increased uh, collector band gap, and the answer up front is, uh, if you do that, you uh, keep control uh, of the collector under very high biases, so you want that for power applications uh, where, you, where you really need to crank up the current or for very high uh, current uh, applications or very high frequency applications where you crank up the collector current and drive the Kirk uh, uh, current up. So, now, how does this look physically? Uh, typically, it's in a pictorial form like this. These are stacked layers. They're grown epitaxially and uh, they're contacted uh, via mesas. So, and on the very bottom, you have an, a semi-insulating substrate, and uh, basically that's an insulator. And you don't want charges free floating there. You want to reduce capacitances in order to get a high speed. And um, uh, that's a typical incarnation in a pictorial way of, a, of an HPT. All right. Now, 
how do you get different band gaps? And uh, uh, how do you choose what materials you want to deal with? Here's a chart, and I blacked out the middle to explain uh, the coordinates a little bit better. Uh, we have talked about three, five semiconductors. We talked about two, six semiconductors and silicon, etc. And each of these have their own band gaps. And the band gap is for these different materials charted here. So you see, for example, gallium arsenide has a band gap of 1.4 ballpark. And maybe you have a, a band gap here of pure aluminum arsenide up here that's about 2.2, sorry, here. And um, these materials have specific lattice constants as well. So here, gallium arsenide and aluminum arsenide have the same uh, lattice constant. So those could be grown on top of each other very nicely. Remember, if you don't have lattice matched structures, you're going to build in strange uh, strain or, or defects because the, the atoms would like to line up in a perfect crystal. So you'd like to have a, a, um, a lattice system or a material system that has roughly the same lattice constants. Okay. So, for example, it will be very hard to, to mix and match indium arsenide uh, with gallium arsenide here. The lattice constant is very, very different. So that would be harder. Uh, it would be hard to have pure gallium arsenide um, be grown on indium phosphide because the lattice constant is so different. So there's an art of growing materials on top of each other and um, um, people have refined that art over the last 30 years or more of uh, in epitaxy processes and there is uh, a variety of epitaxy processes you want to have the simplest fastest growing process that gives you the cleanest material all right so let's pick an example here of gallium arsenide and aluminum arsenide so they have the same lattice constant ballpark very close so that means you can grow them on top of each other okay so you could have a heterostructure that might look like this. You, you grow gallium arsenide and then you grow aluminum arsenide on top of it. And that gives you a bigger band gap. Okay. So that, that's a typical heterostructure we could draw. And then you could maybe even draw, uh, grow gallium arsenide again. And you have a barrier. And, uh, remember we did calculations, uh, through periodic potentials and you can do these kind of calculations now but you build your own new quantum system. So there's a whole class of band gap engineering efforts going on to build uh, heterostructures that have new band structures. What you can also do is you can build an alloy between gallium arsenide and aluminum arsenide, and that might be aluminum X, gallium, arsenide, gallium one minus X arsenide. So the arsenide, uh, arsenic atom is common, but then uh, you have a, uh, a, a ratio of X and 1 minus X of aluminum and gallium in the system. And if you do this and you, say, ramp up the concentration of aluminum uh, at, when you start from gallium arsenide and slowly grow the material and have a turn on aluminum more and more and turn off the gallium uh, more and more uh, in, in your shutters on your epitaxy, you can build a graded a heterostructure like this, okay? And then you could grow, say, this uh, aluminum gallium arsenide with 40% aluminum on top, okay? So you can design uh, different materials on top of each other and they will have different band gaps. So that's feasible. And a typical example is here, this gallium arsenide materials class. In this materials class, you have gallium arsenide has a small ba band gap, and aluminum gallium arsenide is the barrier material or has a higher gap, okay? Now, there's other classes of devices or other classes of materials. And this chart here is actually a pretty famous one that where people chart what the binary materials, uh, um, lattice constants and um, band gaps are. So I had sketched here uh, aluminum arsenide and gallium arsenide uh, that have um, a common uh, lattice constant, so they they uh, are stacked vertically here. 
Um, and then you can have gradings in between and grade uh, in alloys to other materials. Now, let's look at, uh, for example, the material here, indium phosphide. It has a lattice constant that is uh, quite a bit uh, bigger than the gallium arsenide lattice constant. And in the indium phosphide material class, this is often used as the substrate. So you'll see a lot of uh, transistors, HBTs, be built on indium phosphide. So this is the indium phosphide substrate. It has a relatively high band gap. Now, underneath on this um, sort of dashed line here, there's a material indium gallium arsenide. And where does this come from? Well, indium arsenide is here, gallium arsenide is here, and you build an alloy, indium gallium arsenide. And if my memory serves me right, it's like indium point, uh, four eight or so, gallium point five two arsenide, okay? I'm not, it's ballpark that, I forgot. But when you talk about um, in-gas on indium phosphide, there's really just one specific concentration that will give you a lattice-matched alloy that, that grows well on indium phosphide, okay? Then there's another one that's up here that comes from aluminum arsenide getting mixed into indium arsenide. And I think this is aluminum 0.52 indium uh, 0.48 arsenide. Not quite, but it's it's a slightly different um, mole fraction of the alloy. Either way, now these three materials uh, stack vertically on top of each other, and they build a class of materials that are lattice matched, and um, they build the foundation for a lot of HBT technology. So this is, in a sense, if you will, a toolbox of available materials where you can uh, get different band gaps and tune your system to have different band gaps. You can also uh, modify uh, some fractions of uh, alloy concentration and introduce strain into the system that may be advantageous. So. This is like a toolbox in which you can play, and you need to be aware of this chart, and, and at least you should have seen it once to kind of get an idea of what materials have particular band gaps and uh, con um, lattice constants, okay? All right, so this is our toy box, our toolbox, um, and our applications and the rough concept. So. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, the equilibrium solution. Of course, we're going to solve again um, Gauss's law or Poisson equation. And um, I'll do that in the next section. I'll see you then.